Welcome back to Sociology, and we're going to carry on with society, social structure, and social interaction. Now, in this part two, we will explore social institutions and social interaction. So, included topics are stability and change in a society. We're going to look at some of Durkheim and Tone's then more on the social interaction by using the micro perspective looking at how we gain meaning and construct reality and these and roles of nonverbal communication so let's get right into this now stability and change in societies hmm change in social structures have a dramatic impact on individuals and groups both Emile Durkheim, he came up with mechanical or an organic solidarity, and Ferdinand Tones, Tonys, um, he came up with what's known as Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, developed typologies to explain the process of stability and change in social structures of society. And we'll start with Durkheim. He was, he was primarily concerned with what holds society together pre-industrial society, so this is pre-industries that we know as common industries, this is going back 150 years, were held together by strong traditions and by members shared moral beliefs and values. And that was maybe more easier to do as a lot of people were farming. And so keeping people together um, through church, through groups was maybe more, it was easier to do in a pre-industrial time because when the industrial societies were held together by members shared dependence on one another because industrialization started to introduce urbanization where people moved into this so the social solidarity stems from society's social structure in which in turn is based on society's division of labor division of labor refers to how various tasks in a, of a society, sorry, were divided up and performed. People in diverse societies, or in the same society at different points of time, divide their tasks somewhat differently. And it's based on their own history or physical environment or the level of technological development. Now to explain social change, Durkheim, he developed a typology. The methods uh, typology is a method of study and classification by making classifications of things that's typology and that categorizing societies as having either mechanical or organic solidarity so let's define those mechanical solidarity the social cohesion of pre-industrial societies the time before machines um, let me just think, the Industrial Revolution was from 1750 to 1850. So we're going back into the early 1600s in which there were a minimum division of labor. People feel united, have shared values in common social bonds. There wasn't as much women do this and men do that at that time. Durkheim used the term mechanical solidarity because he believed that people in such pre-industrial societies feel more or less automatic sense of belonging. You didn't have to seem to work at it. Social interaction is characterized by face-to-face, -face, intimate, primary group re you know, relationships. Everyone is engaged in similar work and little specialization is found in the division of labor. Organic solidarity, well, let's look at that one now. The social cohesion in industrial societies in which people perform very specialized tasks and feel united by their mutual dependence. Now, Durkheim chose the term organic solidarity because he believed that individuals in an industrial society come to rely on one another in much the same way that organs of the human body function interdependently. Social interaction was be, would be less personal, more status oriented, and more focused on specific goals and objectives. People 
no longer relied on morality or shared values for social solidarity, as in the mechanical way. Instead, they are bound together by practical considerations. Now, the next guy, Ferdinand Tonys, his terms include, and I mentioned earlier, Gemeinschaft is one of them. And it's a, tra you know, a traditional society in which social relations are based on personal bonds of friendship and kinship, so it's family, and on inter intergenerational stability. These relationships are based on ascribed, born into or born with, rather than achieved statuses, chief status being earned, in which society's people have a commitment to the entire group and a sense of togetherness. Now, Tones, he used the German term Gemeinschaft because it means commune or community. Social solidarity and social control are maintained by the community. Members have a strong sense of belonging. They also have limited privacy. Gesellschaft is a large urban society in which social bonds are based on impersonal and specialized relationships with very little long-term commitment to the group or consensus on values. In such societies, most people are strangers. If you walk in a major city and walk around, you will recognize that you don't know very many people, and so there are a lot of strangers. And these strangers who perceive that they have little in common with most other people. Consequently, self-interest dominates, and little consensus exists regarding values. Now, Tones used the German term Gesellschaft because it means association. Relationships are based on achieved status in the interaction among people are both rational and calculated, less personal. Now we're going to move into the social interaction and we're going to look at a micro perspective. At a micro level, Social interaction, the process by which people act toward or respond to other people, is the foundation of meaningful relationships in society. Remember, the macro view is the face-to-face, -face, the dialogues that are created between people where they gain shared meaning. Social interactions within a society uh, is guided by these shared meanings expectations of how are we to behave. While interaction rituals may be shared, the subjective meanings individuals assign to them are not. Now, since we each have subjective meanings of the world around us, how do we construct a reality that we all fit in? Well, the social construct of reality refers to the process by which our perception of reality is shaped by the subjective meaning we give it to an experience. Now, subjective meaning means it comes from me and yours comes from you. Meanings which are in turn influenced by our race, ethnicity, gender, and social class. These are all ascribed statuses. Sounds like we have a different realities when you have all these different variables. How do we have a shared reality? And yes, we do. Not so different and yet pretty different based on the combination of ascribed, born with statuses, and achieved, what we earn statuses, and are all our individual life experiences. Dominant group members with prestigious statuses may have the ability to establish how other people define reality. Dominant groups perpetuate a dominant worldview that is frequently seen as the social reality. Ethnomethodology. Now that's a term, it's a mouthful, but it's the study of the common sense knowledge that people use to understand situations in which they find themselves in. Ethnomethodology contributes to our understanding of meaning by exposing subconscious social reality using breaching experiments to reveal background expectancy. Now, I'll get into that. 
Ethnomythologists examine existing patterns of conventional behavior in order to undercover people's background expectancies. So their shared interpretation of objects and events as well as their resulting actions. So to uncover people's background expectancies, ethnomythologists um, frequently break the rules or act as if they don't understand some basic rules in social life so that they can observe other people's responses. Now that's what's called breaching experiments. These experiments are interesting as a person would do something as if they are unaware of the rules to see what the reactions are. My wearing shorts in the winter are a great example. I wear shorts, go outside, walk around. It's just the way I live my life is in shorts. But the number of people who need to point out to me that that's not okay is quite remarkable. Irving Goffman considered what he called dramaturgical analysis, which is a study of social interaction that compares everyday life to a theatrical presentation. As part of the presentation, individuals engage in impression management, the effort to present themselves to others in a way that is the most favorable way of their own interest or image. You might want to check out the example provided in your textbook on page 126 to page 128. Now we're going to move into sociology of emotions and nonverbal behavior. And we are socialized to feel certain emotions and we learn how and when to express or not to express emotions. We acquire a set of feeling rules which shape the appropriate emotions for a given role or a specific situation. Feeling rules can include how, where, when, and with whom an emotion should be expressed. So if we're at a funeral, funeral, uh, sorry, feeling rules tell us which emotion are required. You know, your sadness and grief, for example, and which are acceptable, a sense of relief that the deceased no longer has to suffer, which are, which are, unex and which are unacceptable examples, which be enjoyment of the occasion by expressed, you know, expressed by laughing out loud. And so the sociology of emotions helps us understand the social context of our feelings and the relationship between the roles we play and the emotions we experience. It is frequently reported in research that much of what we communicate to one another is via nonverbal communication. Now, nonverbal can include your voice tone, cadence, the speed in which you speak, the timing, gestures, facial expressions, body positions, use of space, there are many. So let's look at some of the nonverbal communication issues and the transfer of information between a person without the use of speech. Now, bear, bear witness here. Use of speech, you can have tone, cadence, pitch, but not the words is when they use speech. It includes not only the visual cues, gestures, and appearance, but also vocal features, inflection, volume, pitch, and environmental factors, how you use space, your position to one another, that all can affect meaning. So what functions do nonverbal communication provide? Well, we, may, we obtain our first impressions of others from various kinds of nonverbal communication. The clothing people wear, their body positions, help provide our first impressions. Nonverbal communication provides information about emotional states. Head and facial movements may provide us with information about other people's emotional states. And others receive similar information from us. Now, through our body posture, our eye contact, we can signal that we do or do not wish to speak someone. For example, we may be, you know, looking down at the sidewalk on a street or off into the distance and we pass a homeless person who looks as if they are going to ask us for money. Nonverbal communication establishes the relationship among people in terms of their responsiveness and power over one another. 
we show that we are responsive towards or like another person by maintaining eye contact or attentive body position and perhaps by touching or standing close. Nonverbal communication is used to express power and control over others. In 1956, Goffman suggested that demeanor or how we behave or conduct ourselves is relative to social power. The term that came out of that was deference, which is the symbolic, um, deference is the symbolic um, meaning by which the subordinates give required permissiveness. So you back down, your head's down to somebody who you acknowledge has more authority than you. It confirms the existence of the inequity and reaffirms that each person's relationship to one another is unequal. Now, facial expression, eye contact, and touching, nonverbal communication is symbolic of our relationships with others. The key issue is the status of the person who is doing the smiling, the staring, or the touching relative to the status of the recipient. Facial expressions, especially smiles, also reflect gender-based patterns of dominance and subordination in society. Women typically have been socialized to smile and frequently do so even when they're not happy. Men tend to display less emotion through smiles and other facial expressions and instead seek to show that they are reserved and in control. Women and men use eye contact differently during conversations. Women are more likely to sustain eye contact, eye contact during conversations, but not otherwise as a way of showing their interest in and involvement with others. Men are less likely to maintain prolonged eye contact during conversations, but are more likely to stare at other people, especially other men, to challenge them and to assert their own status. Gender and power differences are evident in tactile communication from birth. Women may hug and touch others to indicate affection and emotional support, while men are more likely to touch others to give directions, assert power, and express sexual interest. Now, lastly, but not leastly, personal space is an immediate, is there the immediate area surrounding a person that the person claims as private. It's kind of like being in a big office area with multiple desks and how we carve out a little space that we call our own. When others invade our space, we may retreat, stand our ground, or become angry. Our personal space is contained within the visible boundary surrounding our bubble, surrounding our, bu our bubble around our body. Much like a snail shell, power differentials are reflected in personal space and privacy issues. Age, gender, the kind of relationship, social class, ethnicity, religion, help define personal space. Learning to understand and respect alternative styles of social interaction enhances our personal effectiveness by increasing our range of options that we have for communicating with different people in diverse contexts and for varied reasons. While it is difficult to generalize about people's nonverbal behavior, we still need to think about our own nonverbal communication patterns. Recognizing that differences in social interactions exists is important. We should be very, sorry, we should be wary of making value judgments. The differences are simply differences. As we move forward, macro-level and micro-level analysis are essential to the determination of how social structures should be shaped so that they can respond and deal with major social problems such as homelessness, poverty, addictions. Large-scale formal organizations need to become more responsive to society's needs, but we also need to regard social problems like homelessness as everybody's problem. The problem, the crisis, is both structural and individual. The solution also needs to be structural 
and individual. That now finishes and completes our chapter on society, social structures, and social interactions. I hope this has been helpful for you. Take care and bye for now.